When times are tough, the world is about to end, and the world looks bleak. It was impossible, impossible, impossible. There is only one man who can save us from ourselves. The one thing you know when you're born is that you will die. This is Howard Bloom Saves the Universe. I believe they believe it, even though I find it very hard to believe that they believe it. With noted author, speaker, and philosopher, Howard Bloom. Attention is the oxygen of the human soul. And now, here's Howard and our MC, Chad Dugatz. Hello and welcome to Howard Bloom Saves the Universe. With Howard Bloom, I am Chad Dugatz. Howard, the strangest thing just happened. Hello, Howard, by the way. Uh, th- Chad, it's nice to see you. It's nice to see you. I'm glad you say the word C. Howard and I, uh, we sat down at the table. We got our water a, a little behind the scenes. A little sausage making for right. everyone out there who wants to know. Uh, I sit down opposite Howard. I get my computer ready. Keith sets the board. I go three, two, one, start. In that time, as I'm looking at my computer, I look up at you and you put your glasses on. Right. Well, I, you were so wearing I look the... like a totally changed human. I, who is this man? Yes, no, right. I, it's just that my perception. I was not expecting you to see glasses. Right. Uh, you never wear your glasses. I anymore. never wear my glasses. But um, I I was on coast to coast on Tuesday night. Mm-hmm. Uh, they had me do two topics. They oh, usually wow. have me do one. They gave me four hours in which to do eight hours of research. <laughs> so one was Saifula Sapov. And the truck attack in Manhattan. Definitely be talking about that today, yeah. for sure. The other topic was the indictment on Monday morning mm-hmm. of Paul Manafort, of uh, what's his name, Gates, yes. uh, Richard Gates, and of George Papadopoulos. Mm-hmm. Bless you. And because I took tons and tons of notes mm-hmm. and wanted to use them, uh, I have them up on one of my Kindles which is sitting here on the desk. Yeah, you, we've talked about this, but, but it's been a year, so I think we need to go over the workflow. The details. And... Uh, uh, no, 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 of Howard Bloom, because it is Howard Bloom Saves the Universe. Yeah. Howard wears, how many Kindles do you wear? I wear two. You, like, literally wear two Kindles. Yes, that's right. I One have a holster. Is... I have tons of holsters. They're all around my belt. You have a phone on a holster. You have yep. two different Kindles. I have spare earphones. Mm-hmm. I have my credit cards. I have two cameras. Yep. Um, it's just the, the list of things is endless. Two has, pairs of glasses. He has a piece of leather string to which his earbuds are attached, so right. he never loses his earbuds. Right. So you're always... Because a... I pet dogs, and the dogs tend to pull the earbuds off, and I don't want to lose them totally. Yes. So, uh, uh, so yeah, you, uh, you, you, you carry these two Kindles. So on one of these Kindles, you have notes about the week's goings Both and comings. Kindles, actually. Uh, by the way, it is November 3rd. It's a Friday. It's 5-11. So if something happens after this recording and you're wondering, well, why aren't they talking about it? Right. It's because it hasn't happened in right. our reality. But this past week has been crazy busy with news. It's been crazy busy with news. First of all, I think the most important thing this week, and I think we can all, especially you and I, right. can agree on the most important thing, the Houston Astros won their first ever World Series. Oh, I have no idea. <laughs> Neither, it was, yes, right. It's a, yes, their first ever, and they're having their only their second parade in the history of Houston, Texas, a victory parade. Yes. And God knows, that's the sport with the little pointy ball, isn't it? It's the, the one where they... on each end. Yeah, no, that's the one where they stick... Oh, no. Or, uh, no, no, this is the one with the little... The little ball that you hit with a stick. With a stick, yeah. Right. Yeah, glorified stick ball. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so now I have my sports streak. Yes, but uh, to the city of Houston, and if you do listen to Houston, it is a nice victory celebration for the city of Houston, which right at the beginning of the fall Hurricane decimated Harvey. Ha- Hurricane right. Harvey decimated that city. And the baseball team really, th- th- it is actually, in all seriousness, one of those rare instances, or not rare, I shouldn't say, it's one of those instances in general where a city can have a tragedy befallen upon it and rally behind its sports team. The sports team becomes the identity of the city. You and I lived through September 11th here in New York City. Uh, just a month and a half later than that, the New York Yankees were in the World Series, and it really, really brought everybody together. Well, the spirit with which you confront the difficulties of life is all important mm-hmm. because you mm. can see a tragedy as a tragedy, and you can get really down in the dumps And you can keep yourself depressed for years, if not the rest of your life, feeling helpless about that tragedy. Or you can see it as an opportunity. You can see it as something you lived through and anything that you live through makes you stronger. 
Um, and that perceptual lens is all important. So this winning the World Series helped Houston hopefully see things through the most optimistic perceptual sure. lens that it can. Because after all, when you lose billions of dollars worth of property like this, mm -hmm. and you even lose human lives, yeah, which is horrible, did those lose, are not, yeah. not recoverable, um, it's an opportunity to rebuild in whole new ways. In, in Japan, we firebombed something like 70 Japanese cities in World War II. We tried our best to just incinerate the entire cities. We dropped two nuclear bombs yes, on Yes, we the did. We dropped country. two atomic bombs. This turned out to be an advantage for the Japanese. Why? Because our industrial structure was the only one left standing after World War II and was the most modern in the world. But in the time since we had built our industrial structure, there had been new advances in technology. And so the uh, Japanese were able to rebuild with uh, uh, an infrastructure even more advanced than ours. And that gave them an edge and helped account for the fact that it looked like they were going to steal all the marbles mm -hmm. in terms of global economics back in the 1980s. The same thing happened to Germany which is uh, one of the top three exporting nations in the world. They were able to build a more modern yes. um, infrastructure. And if Houston is able to take advantage of this to build a more modern infrastructure and put itself ahead of the rest of the world, then they will have gained something despite all of the losses. But it all comes down to perceptual lens. Well, I know, you know, and we're getting a little off our topic that we want to get to, but I know in Puerto Rico right now they're going through the same thing. There's a, a, a growing voice of energy wise people when it comes to energy, uh, solar, electric, w wind power, whatever have you, who are saying this is an opportunity to implement, for, and, and what's beautiful about Puerto Rico, w what what is its problem being an island is also its greatest strength. Right. Is it self-contained? So it could be a, 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 a the, the, the test beaker of how to be a self-contained energy-creating resource if they went that way, but it looks like, of course, the older methods are going to be re-implemented in a country that needs energy badly. Well, there is a little story about Puerto Rico mm -hmm. that nobody seems to know. Uh, all of a sudden, about 10 days ago, yes. there was an eruption of headlines about the hiring of whitefish. Um, a, By a, the way, whitefish, a good bagel, some cream yes, cheese and right. a schmear. Oh, <laughs> I'm happy. So whitefish is a tiny little company mm -hmm. in Montana. In the same city that uh, Zinke, the head of the, uh, what is he the head of? The Environmental Protection yeah. Agency, uh, comes from. And, and here's an entire island where only 27% of the people have power right now. 73% mm -hmm. of the people do not, do not. have power. Yeah. So that's a desperate situation. And this little two-person company, which is what Whitefish is, was hired to do the job. And uh, the press zeroed in on it in mm -hmm. the hope that it would turn out to be a scandal and that it would turn out to be a company that Zinke had inappropriately shoehorned into the job. No, that's not why Whitefish got the job. Do you have any idea of why Whitefish got the job? I think they were the cheapest bid. It isn't even that. Oh, uh, okay. Puerto Rico is bankrupt. Yes. Um, all of the major energy companies that could step in and rebuild its, uh, inf its energy infrastructure are very busy with jobs in Texas and Florida and Louisiana. Well, right they're going now. after clients that they know can pay. Right. That's it. So they know that if they allow Puerto Rico to hire them, there's a good chance that they'll lay out um, hundreds of millions of dollars and they'll never, ever see sure. a penny come back in. Whitefish was the only company willing to work under those conditions. All the other companies wanted a large deposit before they did any work. Mm. Puerto Rico doesn't have the money for a large deposit. Whitefish, because it's so outside the mainstream, mm -hmm. was willing to work on the come, yeah. um, on the hope that maybe someday Something they would get in. paid. So that's what's behind that scandal. And so, and I haven't seen any sign that after Whitefish was fired, which it was two days ago, mm -hmm. um, that anybody else has been hired, which means all these people in Puerto Rico are left dangling who do not have power. And, you know, you need power. Right. In this day and age, air con there's a gazillion reasons. Air conditioning, pumping water, um, all of the dialysis of machines. Life. Yeah, I mean, uh, air conditioners. Of course. Uh, so, so yeah, it's been a, a, a really jam packed headline news week. Uh, we actually should start this week's news week. Well, let me with start last it because week. I, I want to yeah. get something into 
before well, okay. we do that, and that is nobody seems to have noticed, but President Donald Trump has confessed that he lies. Yeah. But he's he, done it in an indirect way. Um, about, well, God knows, six months ago or so, he was under fire. He was still running. This can't be six months ago. It has to be more like 16 months mm -hmm. ago. He was under fire for having absolutely no foreign policy expertise. Yes. So he apparently asked the people around him, gather every foreign policy expert that you can find. And he put them all in a room with himself and Jeff Sessions. Mm -hmm. And he paraded them to the press and he put up an Instagram photo um, as his team of crack foreign policy experts. Mm -hmm. And he went on television with a typewritten list, a printed list of all of his foreign policy experts. And one of the foreign policy experts was this 30-year-old named George Papadopoulos. Mm -hmm. And as he was reading the, uh, the names off of the list, the president, Donald, or the future president, and then a presidential candidate, mm -hmm. Donald Trump, stopped and said words to the effect of, oh, George Papadopoulos, he's a terrific guy. Yes, great guy. Okay, then last week, mm -hmm. Donald Trump said, oh, George, he was just some low-level volunteer. I didn't actually know him. Well, how come you knew him well enough to say he was a terrific guy? That's right. Um, a year ago, and now you don't know him. So only one of two things is true. Either the president's... Uh, foreign policy team was a sham. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Donald Trump was lying when he said that this was his foreign policy team. Or he's lying now that he didn't know these people. Or there's yet a third option. Both. He was yes. lying then and he's lying now. Now, I leave you to pick which of the options you think is most likely. Well, I just think he's full of shit all over the place. And I don't think he knows what... I think it's just a matter of what do I need to say in this moment. I, I believe it's unconscious with Donald Trump and the lying. I think it is f pure fear and survival instinct that drives him. Nothing more. We have fear. We have flight. We have freeze. We have all those, you know, those three Fs. Three Fs. The th was it flight, fight, fight or freeze. freeze? And I think with him, it's just fight, lie, and get me to the next moment. Well, here's a demonstration of the extent to which this absolute fear freedom from the truth, this, this yes. desecration of the truth that goes on with Donald Trump every day of the week is catching because he is a role model mm. as president. Um, John Kelly, the general, is his chief of staff. Not a role model any longer. Not a role model any longer. The people that I know in the military um, are some of the smartest people that you and I know. Mm -hmm. They have got multiple PhDs, multiple advanced degrees. They care about the values that this country represents tremendously. They, they care about the value of their own word. And they care about the civic virtues, yes. which is where the value of their own word comes in. A democracy is built on a set of civic virtues, uh, infrastructures of a habit, things that we're just accustomed to doing every day, mm -hmm. which includes something called fact-checking, something called truth. Now, Kelly has made two public statements in the last roughly 20 days, and in those two statements... He's been caught lying mm -hmm. because he didn't bother to fact check. Now, every person at his level that I know of in the military is meticulous about fact checking before they make a statement. Of course. But when the uh, issue came up of Donald Trump's making a uh, phone call to the widow of one of the soldiers who'd been killed yep. in Nigeria, and when he was making that phone call, the widow was in a limo mm -hmm. being taken someplace. And uh, she was she being put taken him... to the either the service or to pick up his body. I forget which right. one it was, but it was in relation directly to his death. Right. I the mean, government he... was yes. taking her in a limo. Um, and she put the president on the speakerphone. And her local representative yep. um, was there listening in on the conversation. And in order to discredit that local representative, John Kelly went in front of a press conference mm -hmm. and told a story about how this woman was at a service of some kind for some fallen uh, FBI people. Yes. And how all she talked about was herself and how she had called Barack Obama and she had gotten personally $50 million in order to build this center. All she did was take advantage of the opportunity to blow her own horn mm -hmm. and how disgusting it was. Well, and then the press went and dug up the actual video footage 
of the meeting that John Kelly was talking about. And it turned out that his description was utterly and completely wrong, that um, this building was being dedicated in the names of three fallen FBI Mm -hmm. guys and that the representative was praising these guys. And she had helped to get the building named after these three guys. In other words, she was honoring these guys to the nth degree. That's right. So now there's a simple thing that has been a necessity if you're working anywhere near the presidential level or anywhere near the general level. When you have a memory like that, you go back and you fact check to make sure that it's accurate. But well, in when the you have era a job Trump, like that, yeah. Yeah, in the era of Trump, that is seriously discouraged. You have a public role model, a role model for all 330 million of us, <laughs> um, who just wings it off the top of his head and contradicts himself and lies and and operates on the basic assumption that us Americans are going to be too lazy to fact check him mm-hmm. or aren't well, because care. But why should he think we're going to fact check him when he got through life without being fact checked or called to the task, called to the carpet for anything? Well, because if he had the civic virtues instilled in his character the way that the rest of us do, mm-hmm. then he should have a slavish adherence to the truth. Which we know he doesn't have. Yes, and which Kelly should have had mm-hmm. as well. Now, Kelly, in the last four days, got himself in trouble again, <laughs> yes. talking about Civil War monuments. And he said, if only people had been willing to compromise, we wouldn't have had the Civil War. Well, guess what? Once upon a time, there was a politician who, this is before the Civil War, who proposed a long, gradual plan for the emancipation of the slaves. It was a hundred-year plan. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't have finished until approximately 1950. And in that plan, slave owners would have liberated their slaves, and the government would have reimbursed them for the property value of those slaves. That's a compromise. So we're talking about restitution when the the key things is there's a movement to get for relatives of those slaves to get reimbursed now, back then they're like, well, let's reimburse the people who are losing this. Just right. the mindset's amazing to me. So the guy who proposed this compromise, yes. I don't know if you've heard of him, was named Abraham Lincoln. That's right. So Kelly, when he made the statement once again, failed to do the necessary obligation to the truth, which is fact check yeah. before you make a statement like this. Well, it's overwhelming. All the the all the denial of facts or deny or the unwillingness to even look at the reality in front of you. You know, early on into the administration, right after he won the election, we had the famous incident where Sean Spicer came up on to the to the press podium and said it was the greatest watched inauguration of all time. And obviously the pictures just clearly well, show he said that it was the biggest audience for of an all inauguration time. That's right. of all time. And the pictures just clearly show that not being, being right. And the response from the administration is, well, it's alternate facts. And in that moment, they told you their game plan for the next three and a half years. Alternate facts. And trying to jam down, you say a lie enough times, it becomes truth. You've heard that before, I'm sure. And I think this is just the way they plan on going for the next three years. Well, the tricky thing is that there is a certain value to the idea of alternate facts. What I mean by that is different people have different interpretations of the facts and pile up different sets of facts in order to validate their preconception Mm -hmm. about things. And that's part of the way we arrive at truth is having multiple ways of looking at the facts. But at least the people compiling their lists of alternate facts in those in that case feel an obligation to fact check, feel an obligation to have a substantial body of evidence behind what they're saying. What unhinges and unmoors this president from any concept of the truth is that he feels no obligation to fact check or research at all. Well, that's the insulting part to every American, is that you would imagine your president cares enough to at least try to tell the truth. Now, let's let's look at the other side. Barack Obama definitely lied to the American public on several occasions when he knew A was A and B was B, but told us A was B. We know every president over time has lied. However, the glaring... Uh, reckless abandon in which this Trump administration is lying is so insulting to the American public. I, I think after a while, it's just how lazy are you as a man, as a politician, to not even be good at lying? 
So we've got a con man in chief in the White House. Yes. We like have that. a liar in chief in the White House. We have a bait and switch expert in the White House, in the White House, who has made his living off of bait and switch. One of the ironies of his criticism of Puerto Rico, he says they have handled their financial affairs badly and hence do not deserve the kind yes. of treatment that Houston, for example, deserves. They're in bankruptcy in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. Guess who claimed in the past to be the king of bankruptcy and told us that the fact that he made money mm -hmm. by stiffing other people, by going through bankruptcy so you don't have to pay the people who have given you services. Mm -hmm. um, he bragged that he'd gotten rich off of each of these bankruptcies, and he said that makes him smart. Smart? It makes him a highway robber. Yes. It makes him a thief. It, make, it makes him an outlaw. It makes him a criminal. It makes him a, a snake oil salesman. Right. So he is not in a position to criticize Puerto Rico because he's been bankrupt four times as many times as they have. Correct. So so a lot's happened, obviously, with the the news cycle, with Rob, Robert Mueller's investigation, with Gates, of course, with Paul Manafort and George Papadopoulos. We've now learned since last week that George Papadopoulos has pled guilty to some charges and has probably been reporting and, you know, finger pointing at everyone in the Trump administration and the Trump campaign. George Papadopoulos has said, you know, or had tried to get some meetings between Putin's team and Trump's team together during the election. Sessions said it was a bad idea. Sessions then went on and testified that he never had any well, conversation. Well, uh, there it's, was a yes. hint in today's news that the— that our source for knowing that Jeff Sessions or believing that we know that Jeff Sessions said that talking about Russia was a bad idea mm -hmm. um, is the Sessions, is people around Jeff Sessions. In other words, we don't know if that story is accurate. Jeff Sessions right. saying, no, that's not a good idea and we shouldn't be talking about it anymore. We don't know. Right, because that could be a really good way to cover your ass down the road. That's right. Which is all that seems they're trying to do. I mean... I, Here's the thing, and we'll get back to some specifics. When you have so many cheats and liars in one room all working together on one team, once shit starts hitting the fan, everyone's going to be out for themselves to protect themselves. Everybody has been out for, the, for themselves in this White House from its very first day, right? Um, from January 20th. Um, the press comments over and over again on how easy it is to find sources that are leaking in the White House because the White House is riven by factions mm -hmm. and the factions are fighting each other and they're trying to fight each other using leaks to the press. That's right. They're using the yeah, they're using what they have, their tools at their disposal. All right. So Mueller on Friday of last week, it's released and through the news, CNN was the first to report that some indictments were coming out on Monday. We there learned about this on Friday. There were three indictments, and this is where my notes come in handy. So while you're but, looking that up, so all weekend, all last weekend, right. by the time you're hearing this now, two weekends ago, but all last weekend, it was speculation as to who the indictments were against. We knew there were indictments. We did not at that time know about... Not until Monday morning. ...about George Papadopoulos. About right. And we didn't know about that somebody had already turned. And we didn't know about uh, Richard Gates. Yes. Um, so the three people indicted were Paul Manafort. Mm -hmm. Paul Manafort was brought in to run the campaign at a very crucial juncture. Uh, the campaign didn't seem to know what... It didn't seem to know what it was doing, even though it was doing extremely well. Mm -hmm. And the uh, Republican convention was coming up. And there was nobody in the campaign who had any expertise mm -hmm. in delegate wrangling at a convention. So Paul Manafort apparently had experience in that area, and Paul Manafort was brought in to handle that. Paul Manafort is a guy who had bought an apartment in Trump Tower and then become friends with, with Trump. So he'd been around Trump for an unspecified amount of time, but it was a good deal longer mm -hmm. than the three months in which he was the campaign manager. However, during that time, he was the campaign manager. And Donald Trump tried to tell us several times over the last few months, many times, mm -hmm. that, oh, Paul Manafort, he was an insignificant figure. He was not in a position of power. He was the campaign manager, for God's sake. But, but sakes. even today or yesterday, I was watching an interview with Donald Trump on the Laura Ingram show which he says it doesn't matter if people are there or not, if people fill these positions or not, because the only thing that matters is me. And that's the way he thinks things happen. Yes. This is it's one all of the about reasons him. he's so incompetent. And all one right. of the difficulties is this incompetent liar has just gotten on a plane a few hours ago mm -hmm. and headed for the East. He's the headed East. for Asia. Yes. He's headed for Japan. He's headed for South Korea. 
He may be making a uh, a, a stopover in Moscow. Yes. Um, he's going to spend time with Xi Jinping. Mm-hmm. And Xi, he's relying on Xi Jinping to help him stop the North Korean nuclear program. Now, Xi Jinping apparently, within the last two days, sent a note to Kim Jong-un saying, don't you think it's time for us to kiss and make up? Or so far as I can see, I haven't yes. seen the text of the note. But this certainly indicates that Xi Jinping thinks that, that Donald Trump is a clown and insignificant, a real lightweight. Mm-hmm. And as a consequence, he can say one thing to Donald Trump and do something radically different, which is what Donald Trump does. He says one thing and then he does something something dramatically different. So Monday morning, we get the two indictments. Manafort, I believe, is being held on $10 million bail. I'm not sure. Uh, Gates is on $5 million bail. And um, one of the things of very interest about Paul Manafort is the man has three passports. Now, How does somebody get three American passports? That's a good question. Uh, Some of the experts speculating on this said, well, if you do a lot of traveling, your passport wears out, and so you get another one. But three, he said, is excessive. Yeah, so, I just don't... And why do you have three passports? With, But there were three with different numbers. Right. That's the part that's alarming. I can understand three passports because they, you run out of pages. My father, uh, throughout the 90s, traveled every week internationally. Right. He would go through passport pages and need new pages. I get right. that. But it was always the same number. Right. So, so Mueller gets arrested. Uh, pleads not guilty, out on 10 million. Gates, 5 million. Papadopoulos is maybe wearing a wire. And what would right. that mean if he is? Well, five days ago, yes. I was infuriated because we were so focused on looking for collusion between the Trump campaign and the Russians that we were ignoring the fact that an active war has been waged against us, that Russia has been waging a cyber war against us. Mm-hmm. And we're so busy trying to get Donald Trump that we're ignoring that war. And our real job right now is to figure out what the Russians did and to figure out what countermeasures we can take to make sure they don't do it in 2018 when there's another election or in 2020 when there's another presidential election. And here is the problem why that doesn't work, okay? Because in order to prevent this from happening again, the government has to recognize it happened in the first place. And right now, the, Re- the, the Republicans are the government. Right. They control both houses and they control the White House. So in order for them or the government in general as an entity to take actions or implement actions or mandates or put in regulation to prevent this from happening down the road, the government first has to accept and recognize that this even happened in the first place. And if the government, again, which is majority Republican right now, recognizes that this happened in the first place, that means their president is an illegitimate president. So it's not in their best interest to even prevent this from happening down the future. Well, thank God there is a John McCain. Yes. Um, because... I can't, believe, I can't believe we're saying that. I mean, eight years ago, we weren't saying that. Right. But I've always admired John McCain Absolutely. for his honesty. Yes. Um, I've always respected him, even when I disagree with him. Mm-hmm. And it isn't easy for me to respect a politician. Yeah. Um, the, the trick is that here I was bellyaching about the fact that we were not paying attention to the information war being waged against us and we're paying attention to Paul Manafort and uh, Richard Gates mm-hmm. and George Papadopoulos instead. And then Salon, the magazine yeah. on the left, made a very interesting suggestion. It suggested that Robert Mueller is following the roadmap of a document that we first heard about in January – 10 months ago, <laughs> um, called the Steele dossier. Mm-hmm. And I the, love that word, by the way, dossier. Yes, it's very neat. Yes. And and the, steel, the story of the Steele dossier is that a publication called the Washington Free Beacon, which is a conservative, radical mm-hmm. right publication, um, spent the money to hire a company called Fusion GPS to do uh, the, the man who, the billionaire, there's a hedge fund billionaire, mm-hmm. Paul Singer, um, behind uh, the Washington Free Beacon. Presumably, the money came from him, though that is not certain. One way or the other, the Washington Free Beacon, the last thing they wanted to see happen to the Republican Party was Donald Trump becoming its nominee. And, of course, that's exactly what happened. Right. So they hired Fusion GPS to do opposition research Mm -hmm. on Donald Trump. 
Once upon a time, we had a flourishing press in the days of morning and afternoon newspapers. And because the uh, newspapers were doing so well, they could afford to hire investigative journalists. Now, investigative journalists sometimes have to spend months or even years investigating a story before they're able to pin it down. That takes a lot of money. Sure. But the press has been in trouble for a long time. And the press has very few remaining investigative journalists, which means that a lot of investigative journalists are out of work. So what are these people doing? Three investigative journalists from the Wall Street Journal, which is owned by, what's his name? And, and Bezos. Yeah. No, Bezos. no, 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 no. The, 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 uh, the Wall Street Journal. Did I say oh, the Wall Street Journal? Oh, no, yeah. you, you were the right. Wall, it's, the Wall Street Journal. Uh, the Rupert Murdoch, forgive Rupert me. Rupert Murdoch, yes. which is owned by Rupert Murdoch, yes. who is a flaming right winger himself. Yes. Um, these guys started their own. They were out of work. So they started their own company. That company is Fusion GPS. They do investigative journalism for hire. You want to know all the dirt on Donald Trump, mm -hmm. you're Paul Singer, or you're the Washington Free Beacon. If you're capable of spending enough money, they'll get you the dirt. Dirt, yes. Um, the Washington Free Beacon eventually dropped uh, Fusion GPS, and um, a legal firm, a law firm, picked up the tab. Uh, that law firm represents the Democratic National Committee and Hillary Clinton. By the way, I love how there's no loyalty with this company in the first place that actually is doing the yes, dossier. right. Like, whoever's They'll paying it for it, anybody. Yeah, they're everyone. mercenaries. Yes, that's exactly right. Um, that's great Mercenaries work. in the information yes. war. So um, at that point, after this uh, Perkins Coy, the law firm, mm -hmm. picked up their tab, Fusion GPS came up with a bright idea. Oh, let's hire Christ Christopher Steele. Christopher Steele was a highly respected British and former British intelligence mm -hmm. agent with deep sources in Russia. And Christopher Steele put together a 35 page dossier. You heard of this back in yes. January. Um, and Salon says, could this be the roadmap for what Mueller is doing? Mm -hmm. Now, what did that dossier say? Well, it had some horrible allegations about some urine play and stuff like that. Yes. Well, it said that the Russians in one part, it said that the Russians have been cultivating uh, Donald Trump for more than five years. Mm -hmm. In another part of the dossier, it said that the Russians have been cultivating Donald Trump for eight years, um, that they have been feeding him information in exchange for him feeding them information. Mm -hmm. Now, the Russian government, like the Iranian government and a bunch of other autocratic governments, totalitarian dictatorships, like to keep track of their potential opponents, um, sure. of their uh, opposition and potential opposition. So the Russians, uh, especially the Vladimir Putin, are very anxious to keep track of the oligarchs, the guys who made tons of money, money after them. the fall yep. of the Berlin Wall, who have moved to the United States because they could be a source of opposition. Well, who's one of the people that they've relied on to give them information about the oligarchs, where they are, what they're up to? Donald Trump. That's right. Now, because he's got half of them in their apartments. Yeah. Um, one of the ways that the KGB and the FIS, that the various um, intelligence agencies in Russia operate is they try to sucker you into deals where you don't recognize that you're operating as one of their operatives. Mm -hmm. And that's apparently the position into which they placed Donald Trump, according to the Steele dossier, as long ago as eight years ago. Right. So we know who's paid for this Steele dossier. Right. Um, and your allegation is, and you're talking to me briefly, not allegation, but your um, contention is that basically Mueller's following this thing Right. Down, right and down in order to do that, you have to follow the leads of Paul Manafort, among others. Right. Because Paul Manafort, according to the Steele dossier, um, has been handling the Trump relationship with the Russians through a, a bunch of intermediaries um, for some time now. So right. he's the vital link in this information warfare chain that allows the Russians to manipulate things in the United States. Which we know they did do. Right. And, and and within this week, we know they've manipulated a lot of things. Facebook ads, Google ads, Twitter ads, they've fake They've done bots. this very effective campaign and of putting cheaply. together graphics yes. that, in, in eight words, um, give you something you can't forget. 
for example, apparently they put together a graphic of Hillary Clinton arm wrestling the devil. Yes. And said something to the effect of who is going to win. Well, you can't forget an image like that. And they've been very good at cranking these things out. And I know that a lot of the Trump fans mm -hmm. on my Facebook, my Facebook page has 5,000 friends because that's all they allow you. I know because I can't get in and I work with you. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and I have uh, Trump supporters among my fans mm -hmm. and they post these hideous things. And it turns out as of this week, we know that these things that they've been posting come from the Russians. That's right. Directly from the Russians. Made up by and used by the Russians. Yeah. And then passed along as news. But that that's fake news. Right. So uh, Donald Trump is right when he talks about fake news. There's a lot of it. It tends to be coming out of uh, publications like The Daily Caller, which is supported by the Koch brothers, mm -hmm. um, from right-wing publications, and it tends to come out of the Russians. And Donald Trump likes it because it's against Hillary Clinton. And the reason that, that Vladimir Putin, according to the Steele dossier, was so insistent on attacking Hillary Clinton was that um, he hates, loathes, and despises and fears well, sure. Hillary Clinton. Well, a lot of people, I think, did. Uh, that could be. But one way or the other, the goal here of the, on the Russian part, according to Steele, mm -hmm. was to destabilize the American system and to destabilize the entire Western alliance. In mm -hmm. other words, to destabilize NATO, because they're not just performing this information warfare on the United States. They're leveling this information warfare against every single country in Europe, trying to destabilize all of them. But don't you think it was effective? It was very effective. Because, look, we're still, as Democrats, you and I, still trying to figure out how we lost. My Republican friends um, say, stop bellyaching about it already. I hear that. Um, well. and, uh, but, and, and the Russians really had no influence on the election. It was Donald Trump's incredible popularity. <laughs> well, look, there were something like 30,000 emails that were leaked from mm -hmm. the DNC and from uh, Hillary's uh, people, job, from what's his name, Podesta, yep. um, and from Hillary herself. Those were used by the right to smear Hillary Clinton. That's now right. imagine what would have happened if 30,000 Donald Trump oh emails God. had been released and how easy it would have been to smear Donald Trump. But no, there were no Donald Trump email releases of this kind. Look, he, and it was the emails alone that won Donald Trump the election, right. that won the Republicans the election. Let's not forget, he stood on a dais and said, Russia, if you are listening, find those 30,000 emails. You will be you will be rewarded handsomely. I, yes. I, I'm very close on the wording. You're very close on the wording. Very close on the wording. That is, how can you not... Here, here's, here's, here's the shit that gets me really upset. I'm sorry to curse, but... How can he say he wasn't colluding with Russia when he went on the stage and asked them to do something? So either he's saying, I'm just kidding, which means the whole thing is just a joke and it's a charade and it's professional wrestling, or, which means he shouldn't have gotten the vote, or he's colluding with Russia to get dirt on Hillary Clinton, in which case he shouldn't have gotten the vote. But the, 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 the fact that he claims neither and ignorance and brilliance at his stupidity... His, he claims he's brilliant. Anytime he does something stupid, he claims it as brilliant. And ultimately, it is brilliant because he doesn't get called on it. Well, yesterday when he was discussing the fact that he doesn't remember who Papadopoulos yes. is, um, he pointed to his head and he said, one of the great memories of all time. That's right. So in trying to indicate that if I don't remember it, that means it was really unmemorable. Well, and then, of course, everybody dug up uh, the footage yes. of him saying that great George guy. Papadopoulos was a great guy. Well, here's what I love about that great memory of all time, and I actually thought about this, is when he's on the witness stand or in his, you know, trying to save his job, if he ever gets called in to sessions, he's only going to say, I don't remember. That's the only thing he can say is, I don't remember. So he's screwed. Yeah. Which makes me very happy to, to, to know. Well, I don't know, because uh, as he pointed out when he said I could walk down Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and nobody would care. Um, he did say that. There's a special set of rules for perceiving Donald Trump. He's so far outside of the norm mm -hmm. that we don't have existing rules to handle him um, or to vet him. So it's there is a reason for Robert Mueller to be following the thread of Paul Manafort and these intermediaries who were used to Russia, like George Papadopoulos, because that's where the connection lies. Um, and the Russians 
are are famous for recruiting people in ways that those people don't recognize, so they don't know that they've been recruited. That's right. And that's what the Russians have been trying to do with Donald Trump, and that's what they've been trying to do with Papadopoulos, and that's what they... I mean, Manafort is different. He's experienced. He's he is experienced. a longtime experienced uh, dupe or yeah. foil or puppet for the Russians. I mean, he's made millions and tens of millions $75 of do- million. Dollars he was parking in uh, offshore bank accounts. That's right. That's, that's a lot of money. By yeah, the way. that's a big tax for case of tax fraud. No, that's a lot of money. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just thinking about like that's a lot of money. Now, if you're a patriot and you believe in America, pay your freaking taxes. Right, right. Because we're all like doing the it. rest of us. Well, that's another. We're not even going to be started on the whole tax issue that happened this week uh, in Congress, and we're never going to see any any of any of it. It's just it's just so impotent. Well, one note on the uh, the tax bill. Yes. The tax bill makes the assumption that if major corporations had more money, they would hire more Americans and they would hire them uh, at a higher rate of pay. I heard this in the 80s. It was called trickle-down econ- yes, economics. Yes, exactly. And we mentioned in our last episode that an expert um, named George Bush, the first George Bush, mm-hmm. called it voodoo economics. Because he knew. Because he knew. Yeah, and, so, and he got but, it from Reagan. Right. So um, the the contention is that if we simply cut the taxes on major corporations, they'll hire more Americans and they'll give them higher wages. The fact is that major corporations in America have between $5 trillion and $20 trillion in reserves. Yes. Are they spending that money to hire more Americans? Of course not. Are they using it to increase the wages that they pay to people? No. So they need more money? To put into their bank accounts and do nothing with, sorry, that's not that doesn't make any sense. Right, and and they're storing all that money overseas away from our tax dollars in the first place. So we're going to give them more money to put overseas. And the way the tax bill seems to be written so far, it allows companies, it gives companies greater tax advantages for money that they make overseas yes. than it does for money they make in America, which is going to do what? Influence companies to make more jobs in America or influence companies to save on their taxes by creating more jobs overseas. It's number two. Creating more jobs overseas is the incentive built into this uh, alleged tax plan. How important is Donald Trump's trip overseas this time around? Very why? Because our alliance with Japan and South Korea is immensely important because, mm-hmm. and uh, I apologize for mentioning this the half dozenth time, yes. but China has a big picture vision. And that big picture vision includes the Belt and Road, yes. otherwise known as the New Silk Road. And that high speed railway and super modern shipping um, system, transportation system, uh, covers 30 countries and 3.1 billion people. And uh, and the Chinese, with that big vision, are recruiting every country they can find to leave the United States in the lurch, Yes, to forget about any alliance with us, and to ally with them. And it's a very tempting proposition, because the Belt and Road will make all of the countries that are involved in it a little bit richer, if not a lot richer. And we have no compelling vision of the kind to offer in return, because instead we have the clown in residence, Donald do, Trump. Do they take him seriously when they come over, when he's visiting? They have to take him seriously because he is the person in the White House of the United States, and he does have at his command the biggest military force in the world. Help me out here. Why is it dangerous for Donald Trump to say that Jeff's that the 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 justice system in America doesn't work. Well, the you've justice heard him say system that. in America doesn't work. But why is it dangerous for the president? To but say I that? haven't heard him say that. What was the context? Oh, in that uh, that he believes the 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 gentleman who ran the people over down in downtown Manhattan, right? Should get the oh, death. He pe- wants them to yeah. get the death penalty, and that it doesn't work. That these people are allowed in the country in the first place. Well, he has. I mean, unfortunately, every once in a while, Donald Trump stumbles across something that could be true. Mm -hmm. Um, When you let in, look, the Muslims that I know are the most wonderful people in the world. Yes. They're very dear friends. And they believe in pluralism, modernism, modernism and freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. But they don't dare say it because, I mean, aside from to me, 
because if they raise their voices too loudly, they would be cut down the way that uh, 12 uh, secular bloggers yes. in Bangladesh were hang hacked to pieces um, as publicly as possible. Mm -hmm. So, but ha roughly half the population of the Muslim world um, is uh, tends to favor the ISIS and yes. Al Qaeda and their approach to Islam. And when you bring in Muslims, you don't know whether you're getting a modernist, pluralist, tolerant person, although presumably two years of fact checking, this guy went through two years of vetting. That's right. Apparently. And those two years of vetting should tell you. But if you're blind to the existence of militant Islam, if you think that that's sheer Islamophobia, mm -hmm. then you're not going to see the evidence that's in front of your eyes, no matter how many years you spend vetting a person. So we need to be more realistic about the nature of jihadist Islam and about the extent of its reach. And we need people vetting these things who are aware of both peaceful, tolerant, modern Muslims because mm -hmm. they're a benefit to this country. Look at the father of the kid who died trying to protect his comrades, yeah, who is on. Muslim, who just put out yes. a book in the last 10 days. He is one of the most magnificent examples Amen. of an American who believes in America's values profoundly Amen. that you have ever seen in your life. So it's important to have people vetting these things who know that there are two radically different kinds of Islam. One is militant, and it's not a fantasy cooked up by Islamophobes. And the other is modernist, pluralist, tolerant. And what we need are the modern, modernist, plural, tolerant Muslims, not the Muslims who can be easily converted to killing Americans. Let's talk briefly about the uh, terrorist attack in New York City this week. Happened Tuesday night, hours before the New York City big Halloween parade. Oh, it was, it was, uh, it, it was 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, yes, yes, Tuesday, uh, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, when we were still just absorbing the, uh, the Manafort indictments. That's in right. In fact, so much so that Coast to Coast had gotten in touch with me at 4 o'clock in the afternoon to do the, um, the Manafort indictments. And then I got an email from George Norrie himself, this is very rare, the host of Coast to mm -hmm. Coast, saying, could you please also do the Manhattan truck attack? So it came as a surprise. And I want to check something with you. Yes. Um, when George asked me, how, do you, how have you New Yorkers reacted to this? I said the following, and I want to know if it's true. Sure. I said, we, we New Yorkers know every day of our lives that there are two cities that are at the center, at the bullseye of the target mm -hmm. for militant Islam. And those two cities are Washington and New York. Here so, in the States, yes. Yeah, so every day we know that we could be hit. And we choose to live here and celebrate our way of life and live it as exuberantly as possible in spite of all of that. That's right. So it was a shock, but it was a shock that we recovered from quickly because it's something we've been prepared for for a long time. Well, I think, I think a, a lot of New Yorkers were waiting Almost for something like yeah, this. Yeah, because we know they're going to happen. But now, let's not forget, I believe it was a year ago. Yeah, it was a year ago at this time, because our friend Lois was in town. Hi, Lois. Where we had the bombing go off down in Chelsea. Right. Um, we are under attack. We're under attack. And it amazes me that we don't see more of this. We're under attack in a war, uh, a world war that's gone on for 1,400 years. I mean, it's actually the arithmetic is more like 1,387. Right, but, we'll but I can around. never keep track. At any rate, and that war isn't going to stop in our lifetime. It's not going to stop in our century. Nope. Um, and we have to live as exuberantly as possible and as creatively as possible, giving as much to the world as is in us to give, giving as much to our grandchildren as we can possibly give in the way of new capabilities, new human powers, new ways to see. Um, that's our job is to continue, continue making a contribution and expanding the very range of humanity um, during our lifetimes, no matter what the threat. But I think you hit the nail on the head in that it's not going to change in our lifetime. No, it's not going to change in our lifetime. It's, but Sisyph it's, a Sis it's Sisyphean. Well, I have news for you. Bring it on. Um, within the last 10 months, mm -hmm. there is a politician in the United States who has tried and succeeded in decreasing anti-terrorism funding by 25%. And that person is? His name is Donald Trump. Mm. So Donald Trump is a fucking goddamned liar. Yeah. He has put people's lives at risk while pretending that he leans in the opposite direction. While pretending. Because in reality, Donald Trump's actions are always radically different 
than his words. For example, Mm -hmm. he told Kim Jong-un publicly that if Kim Jong-un continued making threats uh, against the United States, he would turn North Korea, he would annihilate North Korea. He would turn North Korea into something like a sea of fire. And did he follow up on that red line that he drew? No. So how do you think the Japanese and the South Koreans are going to regard him versus Xi Jinping, who has an iron hand on China, which is about to have the first largest economy in the world. He's just another impotent senior citizen. He's an impotent senior citizen who happens to be a garish, outlandish clown. Right. And that we're stuck with for a couple more years. Yes. And possibly another seven years. I can't imagine him winning re-election. There's so much talk about you know John Kasich over in uh, Ohio becoming an independent or Bob Corker. Or Jeff Flake even becoming an independent. You know, since we were last here, we've had had all those Republicans kind of starting to step aside and saying. But you know, they've been smothered. They've been smothered by uh, what the press is universally calling deflection. That is Donald Trump bringing up other issues. And Donald Trump has got the Republicans and Fox News every day mm-hmm. blaring with headlines about it's time to impeach Hillary Clinton. Yeah, and last I checked, she was not... Not president. Yeah, just want to make sure about that. Yes. Uh, And she only lost by 70,000 votes. No, she lost by... uh, She won by 3 million, 2.9 million votes. Exactly my point. You could look at it that way or say she lost by 70,000 votes. I mean, look, if the Republicans had won two presidential elections in the popular vote Mm -hmm. and then been screwed out of their win by either the Supreme Court or the Electoral College. Do you know how loud they would be screaming? Oh, hell to pay. Yeah, exactly. Well, we Democrats have been screwed in precisely that manner when Al Gore won the popular That's vote right. and when Hillary Clinton won the popular vote. If this were indeed a democratic country, we would have had eight years of Al Gore followed by Hillary Clinton. A couple of years of Hillary yes, Clinton. Yes, I know that to Republicans, that's the ultimate nightmare since they're convinced that Hillary is the biggest crook on planet Earth. But that's the result of a smear campaign that's been funded to the tune of roughly $25 million that's been run against Hillary since 1992. And one of the people who put together um, nonprofit organizations mm-hmm. specifically to do opposition research on Hillary Clinton and go beyond that opposition research to make up entire stories is Steve Bannon, who yeah. has who who financed a film smearing Hillary Clinton and a film based on phony, fake news. Well, he's just a disgusting old man as well. Well, he's bright, apparently. Uh, he's done some interesting things. He has a good track record. But unfortunately, he is uh, uh, he's the American Lucifer. Here's what we know. The American Antichrist. Here's what we know. We have a, a president who... Give him the benefit of the doubt that he doesn't do it, but likes to brag that he does grab women in the privates. Yes, and right. And just he, he lets you grab them in the pussy. That's right. He brags about. It. Now I'm not saying he does it. Right. Because I don't. I know. just can't help when I see a beautiful woman. I just can't help kissing her. That's exactly right. So he brags about throwing himself at her, and that is our president. Right. We have a president who either knew know who's this Papadopoulos fellow is, or lies about knowing who he is. And if both, you, both, or both, or neither, and both, any situation in that, like I draw a there quadrant. is no neither because yeah. we have seen him on tape praising Papadopoulos. That's right. So and you we've draw, seen him on tape saying he doesn't know who Papadopoulos is. You draw, you draw a little diagram. It's like, well, if he doesn't know who he is, that means he was lying, and if the praise was right, that means he's lying now. And either way, is this the man you want in the White House? And that, what bothers me so much is the people at Fox News are not idiots. They are programming a narrative. And look, I watch MSNBC and they are programming a narrative. But at some point when you're programming that narrative and you know it's just all shit, when do you as a human being say, I can no longer be a part of this fake news organization that is Fox News? I mean, I just love that Fox News and faux news are just a couple letters apart <laughs> because that's what it is. It's I mean, just Fox fake. News and phony news. Phone news or F-A-U-X, phone news. Uh. Uh, it's, oh, photos, F-A-U-X. Okay. Yes. Okay. Phone, I mean, it's just all bullshit. So what do you think is the narrative that Fox is programming right now? This is all started with Hillary. This is all Hillary, and Hillary's. they are still trying and beating up Hillary Clinton. And I wonder if this was a male person, you know, if the Democrats had had a male candidate, if it had been Joe Biden, under the same exact well, situation. remember, there was a male candidate that they started beating up on, and his name was Bill Clinton. Yes, 
So oh, yeah, they definitely made it this, about him. him. Irrespective of gender. I, I don't know. I really feel like they're doing even more and more shitty things because it's a female. I, I may be sensitive to that. I do a lot of women's issues shows here. Right. I'm very sensitive to women's issues in my own life. But I wonder, I, I almost feel like because it's a woman, she's getting it even worse. Or maybe I think because she's a woman, she shouldn't get that bad. I don't know. Well, it could be. Um, but I just see the total phoniness of these attacks. Um, and, I mean, for example, it has yeah. been said in the press in the last week, you know that Donald Trump is trying to say that Hillary Clinton sold all of our uranium to the yes. Russians in exchange for a $113 million contribution to um, her husband's foundation. You mean she didn't sell it for the contribution? Uh, apparently, it has been said yes. in the last week that Hillary Clinton didn't really know anything about this deal, um, that the guy who actually was in charge in the State Department mm -hmm. of the regulations uh, that are imposed on a deal like this says that Hillary Clinton never approached him and never put any pressure on him at all. Of course. Um, and there are lots and lots of things that go through the State Department. And let's remember, this uranium is not leaving North America. It is not leaving the United States. That's right. Um, and it, eight other departments, aside from nine departments total, of the nine, one of them is the State Department, which Hillary Clinton was at the head of at that time. There's right. still eight other departments that had to sign off on this. Right. Which she had no power over dictating how they sign off in it. Right. So the the... The deal is that, first of all, there was something sleazy about the Clinton Foundation. Mm -hmm. I know that because my partner in Malaysia was booking, trying to book Bill Clinton for his second trip to Malaysia, his first after he left the White House. Okay. And, um, and the Clinton people said, well, normally we charge $500,000 and all the expenses for a full staff of about six people. Yep. Um, but for you, we'll give you a break and we'll do it for 400000 So Bill was really piling up the money um, in ways that could play a very influential role That's in right. how he decided things. However, he was not running for president of the United States. But he was uh, and, – and Bill and Hillary after Monica Lewinsky – do not necessarily are not necessarily as intimate as they once used to be. Mm -hmm. um, nonetheless, getting one hundred and thirteen million dollars from the Russians, if that's accurate, and apparently it is, I may have the figure a little yeah. bit off, is is disturbing. But it, it's not Hillary. You can't demonstrate a quid pro quo. You can't demonstrate that the funds that the Clinton Foundation raised had any influence on her decisions at all. The one big mistake that was made, a really huge mistake that was made under the Obama administration, and it wasn't just Hillary, um, was when uh, we were attacked in Benghazi and four of our people were killed. And Susan Rice went on television and said that this was a mob protesting against That's, an yes. anti-Muslim movie and that the mob got out of hand. That was wrong. Now, apparently, that was the line the CIA handed to the White House and said the White House must use, although that story needs more thorough fact-checking. Well, do we not now have our own modern-day Benghazi with what happened in Niger? Well, and the cover yes, up or except the not those were soldiers yes. who knew that they were going into a military operation, and a military operation is one where you could be killed at any moment. Did you know we had military operations in Niger? Uh, no, but it makes total sense because um, right Near Niger, there's a guy named Mukhtar Ben Mukhtar, Bel Mukhtar, mm -hmm. and he's otherwise known as the Marlboro Man. He's known as the Marlboro Man because he finances his terrorist group um, with uh, smuggling, and cigarette smuggling is ah. one of his big ticket items. And uh, Mukhtar Bel Mukhtar has pulled off, he, his group is called something like the Brotherhood of Blood, and it's been associated with Al Qaeda, and now it's associated with ISIS. And it has pulled off really major operations. I don't know if you remember, but Algeria, roughly 10 years ago, um, there was a gas plant. I mean, Algeria yes. uh, exports gas, and we all need natural gas. And this gas plant had about 50 foreigners on its compound. And there was a group of uh, jihadists who stormed that gas complex and killed all the 50 people. And that was Mukhtar Bill Mukhtar and his Brotherhood of Blood. So, and now there are competing groups in that part of the world competing to be the ISIS group. 
um, right. or the Al Qaeda group. So this is a very it's very important right now when ISIS is trying to find a new territory to move into where it can set up its operations um, that we make sure they have no place where yeah. they can set up an operation. And if we were to ignore um, the parts of Africa around Niger and around the Sahara Desert, we'd be making a huge mistake. So we have to be there. Yes, we have to be there. Uh, but wouldn't if we're not there, will they not just kill themselves? Uh, no, because these guys recruit. So it doesn't matter if they die at the age of 30 um, because they have lots more recruits. And let's let's end on this because we're we're already at an hour. Let's. End oh, on I this. just wanted to tell you. Yes. That I had my first bookstore appearance for how I accidentally well, started well, the sixties. We're, we're going to get to that, but I want to talk about the, the recruiting thing because one of the things we've talked about on the show numerous times is just the way that ISIS goes about recruiting. Right. Um, it's almost the they're not going out and bringing people into them. They're more along the lines of sending out. Here's what can be done. And what happened in New York? They do both. They do both. But what happened in New York was more an example of here's what you can do too. In and, the Bloomian terms, it's yes. called a parallel distributed conspiracy. It means that parallel you distributed conspiracy. Okay. It means you have lots of people who seem to be isolated individuals but they are getting messages from a central source. They're operating independently with no supervision and no contact, mm -hmm. no telephone contact, for example, with the central source. But because that central source is keeping these people all resonating to mm -hmm. a common frequency, all operating within a common worldview, it doesn't matter that they don't have uh, direct supervision mm -hmm. of these people because these people are their people. And we call them lone wolves. They're not lone wolves. They are, they are parts, effective parts, of the jihadist army. Um, and it's the jihadist worldview that says if you kill as many kufirs, as many, as many non-believers mm -hmm. as you possibly can, that's a direct ticket to paradise. Uh, this man in New York, and I forget his name. You know, I haven't even bothered to learn his name. Right. Well, it's a tricky name. Yeah, and you know what? We don't even know, need to say it. Um, it's not going to be dying a martyr. Now, they might be celebrated uh, in parts of the land and parts of the world. He might be celebrated for his actions, but he won't go down as a martyr. Well, we shall have to see. Um, he's going to be celebrated one way or the other. Where is my copy of this guy's name? It's in here someplace. Well, well um, you look that up. Um, and, you know, they're, they're going to try him, obviously, in federal court. I right. Think, I believe that I know for a fact that New York State and city handed it over to the feds that he'll be tried in federal court. Um, President Trump wants him sent to Gitmo, which makes absolutely no case whatsoever. The man was here in the well, States. Well, he gave up on that idea very okay. quickly after uttering it. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. This man has no filter and shame. Right. And a well, bunch of no other filter things. Is a good, it's a good way of phrasing it. So, yes, we and, uh, have a real problem, President. And, um, and uh, you know, most of us in the West don't believe, or a good many of us in the West don't believe in uh, death sentences anymore. That's right. But the question is, uh, we have so many of these jihadists in our jails, mm -hmm. and so many people have been recruited by forces like the Nation of Islam, um, which has a massive jail conversion program. And the Nation of Islam is a jihadist. Listen, I, I spent a day in a maximum security prison outside Philadelphia. 3,000 lifers were in there. Another 600 people who will see the daylight again one day, uh, but a total population of 36,000. I walked in the prison amongst the prisoners. It's, it's akin to walking through a high school in between class sessions. Right. You were just walking in a prison amongst prisoners, getting from A to B. They were going from job to job or meal to meal or whatever have you. And the Muslim population of this prison prison was astronomical. Ash, and we're talking Latino Muslims, black Muslims. Um, you were seeing everything. Well, remember what Islam's message is to people in a prison. It basically says, your society despises you for the things that you have done. Mm -hmm. And here you are locked up in a prison as a consequence. But if you convert to Islam, you will be the elite yes. of the world. You will be those who are closest to God's message. And the very crimes that got you in here, shooting people, for example, mm -hmm. those are holy deeds in Islam as long as you do them with Islam in your heart and killing unbelievers That's right. and apostates and heretics, um, which is how uh, Islam gets away with killing so many Muslims. I mean, how jihadist Islam 
gets away with killing well, so many thing. Muslims. I mean, They're hypocrites and apostates and heretics. Right, and that's the thing. I, I mean, it, it, if they weren't fighting us, they'd be fighting each other. It's. I think that's for anger. Well, they have been fighting each other, and they've been doing away with great right. numbers of each other, but that doesn't help us. Um, the fact is that if this guy goes into prison and he becomes a, uh, a center of attention among the prisoners mm-hmm. and he is able to spread his ideas, which happens a lot in prisons, his name is Saifulo Saipo. Thank you. Yes. Um, then we have a problem on our hands. And the government has been naive enough to hire imam after imam after imam to be chaplains in the prisons mm-hmm. who, in fact, it has been claimed are extremists and are recruiting extremists. Um, so you put that together with the Nation of Islam's program to make recruits, and you have a real problem because these guys are told that if you do the very things that you're in prison for, killing people, mm-hmm. you will be richly rewarded and you will get an express ticket to paradise. On earth, you will be aristocrats. On earth, you will be among the highest. Right. You will be in power. Um, it's a very compelling message. But not true. And, mm-hmm. and uh, Fidel Castro, when he was in prison, what did he do? He organized a class, and he gave a class in his particular revolutionary theory. Mm-hmm. Um, the the uh, legendary president of uh, South Africa, oh, God, what is his name? Uh, Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela was highly active politically in prison. And we can't afford that with Saifulo Saipov. Um, all right. So we, we hint at it briefly. How I Started the 60s, your book, your latest home, if you would. Uh, you had a big party for it, a big little... Well, it wasn't a party. It was a bookstore appearance. Yes. And I had never done a bookstore appearance on this book before. And it was at a local bookstore called the Community Bookstore, which apparently is much better known than I recognize because I've been living near it for mm-hmm. 50 years. Um, and I expected that about six people would come. You know, when you and I did our appearance for the Muhammad Code, um, the audience was only six to eight people, including your son and your parents, which is three. And by the way, they loved meeting you. They're huge fans of you. Oh, well, that's terrific. I loved meeting them. Yes. So, uh, but we were in such a tiny bookstore that six to eight people filled the bookstore. Yeah, it felt like a good crowd to me. It looked like a crowd, yeah. (laughs) So I was afraid in this bookstore that has a capacity more like 50 people, um, there were going to be six people again, and that would be it. But every single seat was filled. Way to go. And uh, there were people standing, Mm -hmm. and there were two film crews. And when you're talking to an audience, normally you have three or four people who are really with you. And you have to address yourself to them because you need to get the energy to reach the rest of the audience that isn't with you. Yeah, so you're leaning on them to affect the others. Yeah, those people give you the energy. Sure. So... But on this particular night, that wasn't true. Every single one of those faces was beaming from the beginning of the presentation to the end of the presentation. Well, I've said this about this book so many times, uh, how I started, accidentally started the 60s. It's my favorite read of yours because it's, it's not as, what's the word I'm looking for? Ref, re, it's not filled with references. Right. It's not filled with like data and hard science. And you're not backing up a claim with 30 pages of notes, which you did in the Muhammad Code. Right. I mean, half the Muhammad Code, I'm, I'm going to hyperbole well, here. Well, it's 1,930 footnotes. And a lot yes, of those exactly. footnotes have five references. So that's what I'm saying. So, yeah, the Muhammad Code is filled with the, the backing for why you're saying what you're saying. By the way, if you want to understand what this guy was doing with the truck attack, Saifulo Saipov, it is essential to read the Muhammad Code. You won't find this information anyplace else. Um, so why I like how I started the 60s and perhaps why so many people were coming there is because it's you on the page as opposed to your research on the page. And there is a difference. You, 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 I mean, you see that research. Well, I read an entire chapter and I was afraid it was going to be too much because when I timed it, it was 19 minutes and 38 seconds. Mm-hmm. And it's the chapter on the, when the murderers, three murderers picked me up heading from Eugene, yes. Oregon to San Francisco. And the story of how I discovered that there's honor even among murderers. Um, these guys turned out to have good hearts underneath all of their bluster about all. I mean, they told the story of every single person they had killed, every single person they chained in a basement without mm-hmm. food and water, every single person they had thrown over a cliff. Um, it, they were proud of their marksmanship, even though they missed most of the time. Um, so to for these guys to, to all of us have three hours into this long, long drive, 
um, probably a total of a nine-hour drive. For them, three hours into the drive to suddenly become concerned because they thought that I was throwing myself into hell and that I was living a life without a purpose and that they needed to save me. And then working for a half an hour to save my soul is one of the most remarkable things that I've ever seen. Well, I just think you never, what is it, a broken clock can be right twice a day. Yes, <laughs> It's right. kind of that mentality, uh, honor among thieves, if so you So I read that chapter, yes. and I was checking the faces of the people in the audience, and they were with it all the way to the bitter end, um, 19 minutes and 38 seconds. And my, my questioner, you had been kind enough to be my questioner. Uh, no, no, I had been... You had been kind enough to ask me. Well, you did a wonderful job, yes. and I had a terrific time, yes, and that was over our... the Mohammed Code. Yes. Um, and this time, my questioner was uh, Stephen McNick. Stephen McNick is a neuroscientist. Okay. He's a monthly columnist for the Scientific American. He does the Illusion of the Year contest. Mm-hmm. Um, he shows you what illusions, what visual illusions tell us about how our brain works. And so his work is wildly popular. Nova has done an entire hour on his work. Mm -hmm. Um, The Scientific American Mind has dedicated two entire issues from cover to cover to his illusions, to his work. Um, And Steve was terrific because he saw what I think is the real me. My roots are in science. They've been in science since I was 10 years old. Yes. And the questions he answered set me back a little bit because I hadn't heard them before. But they were good, good questions, and it was an exhilarating session, and I wished you had been there, but I know that you're overwhelmed with work these days. Yes, and the Wednesday, I believe it was a Wednesday afternoon. Yeah. When, those are always hard for me to get to Brooklyn. Yeah. And I don't know my way around Brooklyn. Oh, my. It's, that's, you know, it's, I love this city, and I love Brooklyn. Yeah. I just can't figure it out. Well, it's, it's a great neighborhood. So it was a tremendously successful event, and Matt Thorne, who was a... Um, a a prize-winning novelist in Britain mm-hmm. just said that the book is tremendously entertaining and that that's going to be in the pages of the Catholic Herald, I think it's called, the, the National Catholic Paper in Britain. Wonderful. Um, next week. Um, and he called me Prince's PR guru, the polymath, um, Howard Bloom. And I think he said the book was terrifically entertaining or something like that. Which so, it is. Which it is. So uh, you can get the book. Where can you buy the book? Any bookstore, or you can just go on Amazon. Uh, Where do you want people to buy the book? Amazon. Okay. Well, I mean... That's where I buy books. Yeah, as well. And no audiobook for that one yet. No audiobook yet. We haven't made an audio deal. I don't know what my publisher is doing about trying to get an audio deal. Um, But my publisher sent a note yesterday. I'm the first book that she's publishing under her new imprint, Mm -hmm. Dragonfly, which is distributed by Rare Bird. And so my publisher sent an email saying, if only all of the books that I sign and publish get the kind of quotes that How I Accidentally Started the 60s has gotten. Great poll quotes. Yeah, Yeah, I'll be doing very well. So Let's sell some copies of the book, Howard. Uh, Where can people find you in the meantime? Uh, Howard bloom.net oh howard i told you about this by the way we, we can't end the show i'm sorry one last thing okay yeah we at howard bloom dot the ha- howard bloom show. what's the name of this show it's howard bloom saves the universe thank you uh, wait let me do that properly yeah, yeah. howard bloom saves the universe there you go uh we received our first patreon pledge you can support this show head out to patreon.com or patreon p-a-t-r-e-o-n Dot com. And let's give the name of the yes, person we're going who's to, been kind enough. Uh, well, I'm, I'm building up to that. I'm, I'm, okay. say, I'm burying the lead. Okay. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of different rewards based on different monthly subscriptions to our show. It is not necessary. The show will continue with or without you. Um, but it is nice to get some support because there are, believe it or not, some fees involved. And a big thank you to Stan Bend. Thank you, Stan. Uh, and I don't know where he lives. He's a younger fellow based on his profile picture. I'd put him, he, he looks really young. Uh, but that doesn't mean anything because it's a very small thumbnail and I'm wearing really, really thick glasses. But Stan, thank you for being our very first Patreon uh, uh, subscriber. You can support our show. We have all different price ranges, a dollar, two dollars a month, five dollars a month is where Stan is, which is on the higher end of things. Uh, a five hundred dollar month co- contribution gets you a chair uh, a seat here in the office with and we interview you. We interview you as to saying, why the fuck are you spending $500 on this show? <laughs> uh, no, that's not what we do. But um, we, we appreciate the support in every regard. In fact, we found out we were having some problems with our feed. How did we learn about this? From a fan of Howard's. Do you know that person's name? Nope. Uh, uh, but uh, a fan of Howard's. But he was kind enough to say, where's the podcast and why haven't I seen it? And, and, I really and now we it. know why. So yeah. I, I've been able to backtrack that. So 
seriously, thank you for this show. We, we, the only reason Howard and I do this is we love it. We love it. We love you. Yes. And we love each other. And this is one of the greatest highs of our lives. And normally, in the days before we started doing this show, the two of us would walk around moping like depressed, That's right. feeling miserable about life. And now, thanks to you and the energy that you give us, we sit here and we give each other juice that lasts us through the entire week. And I also We've think changed the nature of our lives. I also think it's fun to curse on air every once in a while. <laughs> and, uh, and, and with this, we get to. Well, Howard, thank you. Follow him on Twitter. My name is Chad Dugatz. You can follow me on Twitter or my company website is The Hangar Studios. Dot com as an airplane hanger because I'm very much into aviation so you can learn more about me we're back in a week or so with another episode so uh, please check us out there again thank you Stan Bend thank you Stan Bend for being our very first subscriber to the podcast through Patreon and Howard until next time always a pleasure my friend Chad you're wonderful you've been listening to Howard Bloom Saves the Universe with Howard Bloom and Chad Dugatz to learn more about Howard, visit howardbloom.net. Howard Bloom Saves the Universe is a production of Pro Media and Howard Bloom. Copyright 2015 by Howard Bloom. I'm Matt Tombs. <laughs>